This is the new cryptographic primitives session, and our first talk is on post-quantum single secret leader election. Yeah, quiet, quiet down, everyone, so our speaker can begin. Uh, SSLE from re-randomizable commitments, and the talk is being given by Lior Rotem from Stanford. All right, uh, so thank you, Ari. Um, as was mentioned, I'm, uh, I will speak about post-quantum uh, single secret leader election, or SSLE, and this is joint work with Dan Bonnet and Aditi Pertap uh, here at Stanford. Okay, so just to be on the same page, what are leader election protocols? Uh, these are protocols that allow a set of parties to jointly elect one leader from the set. So the parties run some protocol, they exchange messages, and at the end of the day, one of them uh, is elected as leader. Uh, and this leader is publicly recognizable, and everybody, everyone knows that this is the leader. So these have been fundamental uh, to the research in uh, distributed computing and consensus protocols in particular for decades now. So it should come as no surprise that they all also play an uh, instrumental role in blockchains. And somewhat simplifying, you can think in blockchains of the leader as the one proposing the next block to be added to the chain. So with this application in mind, let's already uh, 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 jump right in and think of two properties that we want these uh, leader election protocols to satisfy. So one is fairness, uh, which essentially says that all parties should have the same probability of being elected. And you can generalize this notion to think of, let's say, every party has a different probability of being elected based on the amount of work they put in or stake and so forth. Uh, but for this talk, let's just think of uh, uh, all parties having the same probability of being elected. And the second property is uniqueness, uh, which roughly speaking says that only one party should be elected. Okay? And again, this can be generalized. You can think, for example, of a sequence of parties being elected. Uh, but for the, the sake of this talk, let's just think of one party uh, as the leader. Okay, so these are two basic properties that we want uh, from leader election protocols for their applications in blockchains. And do we have leader election protocols? Well, one leader election protocol naturally arises in proof of work blockchains. So there, each party gets a cryptographic puzzle, and implicitly the first party to solve the puzzle is the leader. They can propose the next block, and crucially, they append to the block a solution to the puzzle, and then everyone can verify that this party should indeed be recognized as the leader. Okay, so this is what happens in proof of work blockchains. Uh, the leader election mechanism is kind of uh, uh, tangled with the uh, uh, proof of work mechanism. Right, so this is what we said. Uh, but when we move from proof of work to proof of stake, somehow we no longer have this organic uh, leader election mechanism baked into proof of stake, and we need a separate solution in order to have a leader election protocol. Okay, so let's make our lives easier for a second. I promise you that we'll make them harder again in a few slides. And let's assume that we have a randomness beacon, and it's a good randomness beacon. Okay, it's a, it's a beacon that uh, is truly random, uh, it's publicly verifiable, and so forth. Well, with this beacon, it's trivial to have a leader election protocol. We can simply treat the output of the beacon as encoding the identity of the leader, and then, you know, for example, the beacon can output uh, uh, something that encodes the bottom party uh, on the slide, and then everybody knows that this bottom party is the leader. Okay, so this is trivially fair and unique, and it's not hard to see. This is given the uh, properties of the randomness beacon. Okay? So let's try and put this uh, trivial leader election protocol to use. Uh, so now this party was elected, and they can propose the next block. Well. Now everybody knows that this party was elected because the uh, randomness beacon is public. Uh, so this party all of a sudden becomes uh, a target for attacks, right? So for example, you can uh, think of denial service attacks, uh, which pose a likeness issue to the, pro to the blockchain, but you can also think of other attacks as well. Okay, so there's an issue here, and the issue is that there's a time difference between the point in time in which uh, the leader is elected and the point in time in which this leader actually proposes the next block. Right? So this doesn't happen in proof of work because in proof of work, we all learn the identity of the leader with the new block. Right? So these happen simultaneously, but when we move to proof of stake, 
we need uh, uh, another mechanism and this causes this issue of a time difference. All right. So there are several ways uh, to tackle this, this problem. Uh, I will focus on one of them. There are others. And the one that I want to focus uh, on here today is actually requiring an additional property of the leader election protocol, which we call unpredictability. So roughly speaking, and we'll make this a bit more uh, uh, formal in a second, we require that the leader or the identity of the leader is kept secret until they choose to reveal themselves, for example, when publishing the new block. Okay? And the protocol that satisfies all of these properties is called the Secret Single Leader Election Protocol, or SSLE, and this notion was formalized a couple of years ago by Bonetta. So let's be a bit more precise uh, about what we mean when we say unpredictability. So we can think of an SSLE protocol as having two stages. The first is an election stage, so the parties run some interactive protocol, at the end of which each party learns whether they were chosen as leader or not. Right? So for example, here the bottom party learns uh, that she's the leader of the other parties then that they're not. And in addition, the leader also obtains a short proof pie that asserts uh, that they were indeed elected as leader and they can use this proof in order to prove that they are the leader. So then there's a reveal stage, for example, in our context when the new block is published, and the leader can prove to everyone by publishing the proof pie that they are the leader. Okay? And as I said, you can publish pie with the new block, and uh, this solves the likeness issue that we described before. Okay, so this is just to convince you that we're not the only one who care about secret leader election. Uh, this is from the Ethereum roadmap, and you can see that this is quite recent, from a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, so leader election, secret leader election, is something uh, um, that can help solve the issue that I described. Okay, so we have an ocean, we have constructions of SSLE, and actually, since the work of Bonetta, we had quite a few. Uh, so this is not necessarily an exhaustive list, but uh, what I want to do here is kind of give you a landscape of what constructions we have. Um, so maybe the most efficient constructions that we have are from uh, discrete log hard groups with or without pairings. Uh, so this is starting with the work of Panetal, and then we had follow-up works, works including WISC, which is the proposal by the Ethereum Foundation that builds on uh, the protocol of Panetal. Uh, there are suggestions using general-purpose multi-party computation, or MPC, uh, using threshold fully homomorphic encryption, and also using assumptions on isogenies over elliptic curves. Okay, so we have quite a few different uh, approaches that we can take. Um, and you can compare uh, uh, between these constructions uh, in various matrix. One of them, one axis that you can compare uh, is the, qu the question of whether the protocols are post-quantum secure, right? Are they based on assumptions that we believe uh, are post-quantum secure? So for the constructions that are uh, uh, in cyclic groups based on discrete log or strengthenings of discrete log, um, the answer is no. We know that these are not post-quantum secure. Uh, for MPC, well, that depends on how you instantiate the MPC. If you do this using uh, assumptions that we believe are post-quantum secure, then you get a post-quantum secure construction. Um, and for threshold FHE, for the homomorphic encryption and isogenies, uh, we do believe that these are post-quantum secure. Uh, so threshold FHE, we know how to construct from lattice-based assumptions. And uh, at least at the current point in time, we also believe uh, that some assumptions or on isogenies over elliptic curves are also post-quantum secure. Okay? But this begs the question, well, are there efficient lattice-based constructions? So you can instantiate the MPC construction and the threshold FAG constructions using lattice-based assumptions, but these are far less efficient uh, than the other constructions that we have, either in cyclic groups or using isogenies. Okay? And we really do want uh, a lattice-based construction um, even though we have an efficient uh, isogeny-based construction, since we do have a far better understanding of the security of lattice-based assumptions than we do of isogeny-based assumptions. So it's good to also have an efficient construction based on lattices. So this leads me to what we do in this work. And what we do is we construct an efficient lattice-based SSLE, SSLE protocol. And we do that in two steps. So the first one is we re-examine the protocol by Bonetal that was based on assumptions in cyclic groups 
we generalize this and we kind of abstract away uh, uh, the way they use uh, uh, the assumptions in cyclic groups uh, by introducing a new notion that we call re-randomizable commitments. And then we instantiate these re-randomizable commitments using lattice-based assumptions, namely the learning with errors assumption or LWE and the string variant. Okay, so this is what we do in this work. And what I want to do in the time that I have left is I want to talk about this generalized one et al protocol and introduce the notion of free randomizable commitments. And if I have the time, also give you a kind of a flavor of how we construct these from lattices. So let's talk about the Bonetta protocol. And at a very high level, the idea is to uh, use these special types of commitments that we call re-randomizable commitments. We'll define them in a bit more detail uh, in a few slides. And then the idea is that each party commits around the value and we kind of shuffle all of these commitments in some oblivious way. And then we let the random speak and choose one of these commitments uh, uniformly at random. And then the party that issued this commitment is the leader, uh, but since it's a commitment scheme, only they know that they're the leader. So let's see this in some more detail. So we can kind of partition the Bonetta protocol to three steps. The first step is a commitment step. Um, so each party samples a random value k, commits to it using this special type of commitment, and also publishes a hash of this k. Uh, so this is to tie each party to the key value that they chose. So we tie the first party to k1, the second party to k2, etc. And why we do that will become apparent at the end of the protocol. And then the parties engage in a step that can be called shuffle and re-randomize. So they take turns. The first party comes along. They shuffle the commitments. Okay? By shuffle, I mean they apply random permutation onto them. And then they re-randomize the commitments. Uh, so what do we mean by re-randomizing? Well, you can think of, let's say, the bottom blue commitment to K2 is still being a commitment to K2, but it's like a fresh commitment to K2, okay? independent of the top commitment to K2. So this independence could be either statistical or computational, uh, but you should think of this as a fresh commitment to K2, and the same goes for the other commitments. Importantly, this party should also prove in zero knowledge that they actually uh, perform the correct shuffle. So they apply the random permutation or permutation to the commitments and we randomized all of them. Then the second party comes along and does the same and so forth until all of the parties have shuffled and re-randomized. And you can kind of see that if we have one honest party, then by the end of this shuffle and re-randomizing procedure, we end up with a vector of commitments um, to the same values as we started off with, but no single or no coalition of the parties should be able um, to link the bottom commitments to the top commitments. Okay, so this is kind of intuitive and, and we'll see why that is in, in some more detail in a second. Now finally, we have this vector of commitments. We let the randomness beacon select one of them at random. For example, here it's the second commitment in the vector. Now, the party that issued the commitment to K3 can test this against K3, see that they are indeed the leader, uh, so they know that they're the leader because we can't link the bottom commitment to the top commitment, so intuitively no one else knows who is the leader. Um, and to prove to everyone that they are indeed the leader, they publish K3 and an opening to K3. Okay, so you can somehow massage this in various ways, but this is the, the core idea. And now everyone can test that K3 is indeed the key of the third party uh, by comparing this against the hash value that was published and also check the opening to the commitment uh, that is included in the proof pipe. Okay, and now everyone's convinced that this party is indeed the leader. So this is like the, um, an abstract view of the BAG protocol. Okay, so does it satisfy the three properties that we wanted, namely fairness, uniqueness, and unpredictability? So it's not hard to see that fairness is guaranteed um, by the randomness of the beacon and also uh, the proofs of correct shuffle. Uh, I won't get into detail about this. Um, but does this protocol satisfy uniqueness and unpredictability? Well, this depends on the exact properties of the commitment scheme. And it turns out that we need uh, a non-standard commitment scheme for that. 
Okay, so this leads us to the notion of re randomizable commitments or RRCs. So, what properties should they satisfy? Um, well, firstly, they have to be, well, re randomizable, right? By that, we mean that if I produced a commitment to some value k and then someone else came along and re randomized this, uh, they should be able to do so even without knowing k or the randomness that I used. And then I should still be op should sorry should still be able to open the commitment, even though I don't know the randomness that was used to re-randomize. Okay, so this is necessary for the description of the Bonetal protocol to even go through. Secondly, the commitment needs to be binding. So this is the standard notion of binding. An adversary shouldn't be able to produce a commitment with two different openings, and it's not hard to see that this is necessary for uniqueness, so that we have just one leader. And finally, recall that we mentioned that we want the bottom commitments to be unlinkable to the top commitments. Um, well, we formalize a notion that is necessary for that, uh, which we call unlinkability. So given two independent commitments, if I take one of them and re-randomize it, you shouldn't be able to tell whether I re-randomize the left one or the right one. Okay, so this is unlinkability and this is necessary for unpredictability. So these are re-randomizable commitments. Just to give some intuition to this notion, let's see the construction of free randomizable commitments from the decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption, or DDH, uh, that appeared in the Bonnet al construction. So we have some secret group G of order K, uh, for order Q, sorry. To commit to a random value K, we just sample a random exponent R, and then the commitment is G to the R, comma G to the RK. And to re-randomize, we can just sample a different R prime and take both coordinates to the power of R prime, okay? And to open, we just provide k, and everyone can test that the first coordinate taken to the power of k is equal to the second coordinate. So it's not hard to see that this is perfectly binding. Uh, if you believe uh, the decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption in a specific group, then this is also unlinkable in this group. Uh, unfortunately, we know that this is not post-quantum secure. Okay, so there are quantum attacks against the de decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to instantiate this notion of free randomizable commitments from lattice-based assumptions, and namely, we'll see the gist of our construction from LWE. Okay, so let's try and uh, uh, construct this uh, uh, from lattices. Uh, we'll start with a kind of a flawed attempt, uh, but this flawed attempt will already take us 70% of the way, um, and then we'll kind of uh, see a sketch of how to fix this. Okay. So now we want to commit, now our, our random values are vectors k, okay? These are vectors uh, in zq to the n, uh, where q and n are parameters of the scheme. And to commit to this vector k, and this is standard in lattices, what you do is you sample a random tall matrix A in uh, zq m by n, and the commitment has two, two coordinates, the first is just A, and then the second coordinate is A times k plus mu, okay? Where mu is a short noise vector. So it comes from a distribution that's just, just centered on, uh, um, kind of concentrated on vectors with uh, low norm. Okay, so this is the commitment. And to open, I can just give you k. And you can compute a times k by using the first coordinate. And then you accept if this is close to the second coordinate, right? Recall that this mu has low norm. Uh, so if I gave you the correct k, a times k needs to be close, let's say, in Euclidean distance to the second coordinate. Okay? And this is, uh, this is the commitment scheme. So how do we re-randomize? Re what we do is we sample uh, a random Bernoulli matrix uh, of size n by m, so it's a square matrix, and then we multiply both coordinates with this matrix. Okay? So let's, let's observe that this is still a commitment to k. So let's call R times A simply the matrix RA. So what we get on the bottom is the matrix RA after we randomization. And the second coordinate, if we distribute the multiplication by R over A times Q plus mu, which is B, you get RA times K plus R times mu. Okay, but since R uh, has small entries and mu has low norm, um, it's not hard to see that if I haven't re-randomized too many times, R times mu should still be a low norm vector. 
Okay, so if I test the first coordinate at times k, I should, st I should still get something which is close to the second coordinate. So is it unlinkable per the definition that we saw before? Uh, the answer is yes, right? So recall that to prove unlinkability, what we need to prove is that if you take two uh, um, random commitments and we randomize one of them, you shouldn't be able to tell um, if I randomize the left commitment or the right commitment, and this is indeed the case, okay? So we proved that this is the case uh, by relying on the learning with errors assumption and the leftover hash lemma. So if you know this, uh, this is not a very complicated proof, and if you don't, I'll be happy to discuss it offline. Um, but is it binding? And the answer is no. Uh, so to see why that is, let's recall that to break binding, the adversary needs to come up with a commitment, namely a comma b, and two keys, k and k prime, such that k is an opening to the commitment, and also k prime is an opening to the commitment. Put differently, a times k needs to be close to b, and also a times k prime needs to be close to b. So here's a claim that says, you know, why we might hope that this is binding. So if A is tall enough and it's random, then with overwhelming probability, there are no K and K prime that are mapped close together by A. Okay, so maybe we can have binding. The problem is that this A is not random. It's part of the commitment, okay? And the adversary can choose it, and it's not hard to choose an A and K and K prime such that A does map K and K prime close together, so there's the, this commitment scheme is not binding, and it actually translates to an attack on the SSLE protocol. So we need to do something else in order to get binding. Um, so I just want to convince you very quickly that simple fixes does, do not work, right? So we can try and force the adversary to choose a random A somehow. So one way is to just include this in the public parameters, right, and then fix this once, once and for all. Another way is to uh, force the adversary to choose the matrix A by uh, applying a hash function to some seed of its choice, and if it, this hash function is modeled as a random oracle, uh, then we can hope that this is random. Uh, so this indeed gives us binding, and it's still uninkable. The problem is that we don't really know how to re-randomize this. Okay? We lose the structure that we had before, and this is no longer re-randomizable. So what to do? So here's the observation that we use. Um, if you choose A, K, and K prime at random, well then with overwhelming probability, A times K is far from A times K prime. Uh, in particular, if we switch the order of quantifiers, this means that for random K and K prime, there are very few matrices A that map them close together. Okay? So there are still matrices A that map them close together, but maybe we can amplify in some sense. If we choose, if we commit to two vectors, it's not just one, there are even fewer matrices that map the first pair of uh, vectors close to the second pair of vectors. And we can keep going, and if you choose the number of vectors that you commit to to be large enough, well, then there are no, no matrices that map uh, a random set of vectors close uh, to another set, a random set of vectors. Okay, so this is what we show. And uh, the idea then, right, these Ks are also not random, they can be chosen by the adversary, so the idea is to force the adversary to choose these Ks at random. So what we do is instead of committing to a vector K, uh, K now is, uh, is some string value, to commit to it you apply a hash to it, and then you do the same as before. You treat the result of this hash as uh, a roughly square matrix, and the commitment is just A comma A times hash of K plus some short uh, noise matrix. Again, we show that this is indeed binding. Uh, to open, I can just give you K. You verify as before, you just need to recompute the hash. And this is also re-randomizable as we saw before. Okay, and we prove that if this H is a random oracle, that this is binding and also unlinkable, assuming the learn with errors assumption. Okay, we're not quite done, right? Well, we are quite done with the slides, but uh, we're not quite done with, with the construction. Um, so I'll just tell you why, and you can see the paper for more details. So by defining an incompatibility, we said that if I give you two random com commitments and re-randomize one of them, uh, then you shouldn't be able to tell which one are re-randomized. But in SSLE, I might need to re-randomize commitments that have already been re-randomized by an adversary. Right, so they don't come from the actual distribution of commitments, they come from some other distribution, 
And so we need dynamic ability to hold also if the commitments come from this distribution. Okay, so we need to somehow massage the definition and do some more tricks in order to get an incability that is sufficient for SSLE, and you can see the paper for details. Also in the paper is our construction from Ring LWE, which is much more efficient, and I also mentioned that you need some uh, zero knowledge proof of correct shuffle, so this too needs to be post quantum secure, so you can use, uh, let's say, general purpose post quantum secure SNARKs like Starks. Uh, or we also show that you can have a specific uh, uh, lattice based proof of shuffle uh, by Costa Martinez and Murillo, and we kind of uh, adjusted it to fit our, our needs. Okay, so we saw that SSLE can be useful when moving from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, we show the practical SSLE protocol from assumptions, lattice based assumptions that we believe are post quantum secure, and we introduced this new notion of RRCs. Uh, and now the question is, you know, can we have more efficient constructions? Okay, so are there, there are a bunch of open questions, but the one that I think is the most important is coming up with a completely new way to do SSLE. Okay, so we have a few ways. Um, there's no you know, specific reason to, to assume that these, these, these are the best ways. Okay, and if you have a much more efficient way, then this will be good. All right, so that, with that I'll conclude. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. Yeah, please uh, use the microphone. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for your talk. This was great. I had a question on efficiency. Yeah. So, one aspect is time efficiency. There is one more aspect, and it is particularly the case for FHE based systems where memory could be an issue. It requires a lot of memory to store those matrices and uh, uh, those kinds of things. Have you, what are your thoughts about memory based efficiency? Yeah, so, so we discussed several solutions in the paper, right? For example, um, if you make some further assumptions, you can maybe share this matrix A among everyone. Uh, and in our full construction that I, that I haven't described, the second coordinate of the commitment is actually much shorter than the first can be made much shorter than the first coordinate of the commitment. So there you can save uh, quite a bit of space. Sure. Hi, I have a question. Uh, this relates to the slide, uh, the big matrix slide, the BEHG protocol that had many cells about commitment steps from K1 through K5. Uh, I'm wondering. You mean this one? It was the multicolored BEHG protocol slide with, with five actors yeah, okay. on top and three actors on the right, on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's one. So could you, could you uh, explain what the commitment function is in lower level at a more uh, fundamental level? Yeah, so in the Bonetta protocol, in the original Bonetta protocol, this is just uh, this commitment, right? To commit, you commit your random value k by computing g to the r comma g to the r k or random r. And what we did was reconstructing this commitment from lattices and our. So I haven't presented our complete construction, uh, but the basic construction is this: to commit to a string k, you hash it using some hash function, let's say SHA, and you compute this random matrix A, comma, A times the result of the hash plus some noise. So that's matrix multiplication plus hashing. Yeah. In short. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sure. Okay. We have time for one more one question. More. Me? Okay. Um, hey, yeah. Thanks for the great talk. Lots of fun. Um, I guess I was thinking about efficiency in another sake, so like the number of parties um, and like I guess like the latency to pass the messages between those parties. like. Do you, does that seem like a bottleneck for this protocol? Because like I guess like thinking about like the number of like validators on Ethereum to create this randomness, that seems like that would be like a bit slow, right? Yeah. So I should mention that the like the, the shuffle and randomization kind of pattern that I presented here is the most naive one. Okay. You can come up, and people have come up with other shuffle patterns that are more efficient, both in terms of uh, how many times each commitment needs to be re-randomized. Uh, how many rounds 
you have to do how many commitments each party will randomize it and so forth. Uh, so there are optimizations to this to this procedure. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, we'll talk offline. Sure. Thank, sure. You. thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. All right, thank you. Our next talk is an invited one. We're delighted to have Dankrad Feist from the Ethereum Foundation. Okay. And Dankrad will be talking about data availability, sampling, theory, and practice. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, so I, want, uh, I would like to give an update on um, data availability sampling. Um, so my talk, um, I will start uh, going into um, blockchain scalability and data availability, why data availability sampling is so important. Um, and then I want to go through all the things we have learned uh, mainly over the last uh, one or two years um, that have brought us much, much closer to um, implementing this goal. And uh, in particular, I will go um, into the um, encoding um, progress um, in uh, the theory, understanding um, uh, what, um, what is important in data will be sampling. Um, I will uh, look at uh, current implementation progress in computing encodings and proofs for them. And then um, I will go into the um, uh, DAS problem of uh, providing samples. So how do uh, nodes get their samples? And in particular, I will uh, go into two different models we have for these and um, what we have seen um, uh, recently, what, um, how we've gotten better in this. Uh, and finally, I will summarize and uh, talk about open problems. So blockchain scaling and data availability. Um, uh, many of you will have seen this. This is the famous uh, blockchain scalability trilemma formulated by uh, Vitalik Buterin, um, which says that um, uh, constructing a blockchain that uh, fulfills these three criteria, scalability, security, and de decentralization, um, is a difficult problem. In particular, it doesn't say that this is impossible. In fact, we now know that it is possible to construct such blockchains, but um, the, the techniques necessary for this weren't available in uh, 2015 when um, this was first thought of. Um, and so let's try to understand why this is difficult. So when we talk about decentralization in blockchains, in particular what we mean is that um, people should be able to run nodes at home to verify this blockchain. Um, so this is, um, this is uh, your little node at home that uh, verifies, say, the Ethereum blockchain. And um, uh, in particular, it has two uh, pretty important constraints. And uh, one is execution. It has limited uh, capacity for um, computation, and the second is bandwidth. It has like um, your at-home internet connection, which um, uh, is limited, and depending on where you are, can be between a few megabits to like a few hundred megabits, but it in particular isn't a data center type uh, connection. And so if we look at uh, the blockchain stack from a modern point of view, um, uh, then there are basically four, four layers. Um, at the bottom is consensus with data availability, settlement, and execution. And there are two of these that require scaling. Um, so consensus itself like, um, is, does not limit the number of transactions you can process, and neither does settlement, because you can settle, settle a very large number of transactions with very few um, transactions on the settlement layer. But um, execution and data availability need to be scaled. And um, for execution, uh, we, have, um, we have basically found um, a good way to scale it um, that is, um, uh, well, very actively um, being built right now. That's, uh, the, th those are roll-ups, and um, they come in two flavors, um, either optimistic roll-ups that use fraud proofs to prove correct um, execution, or the so-called ZK roll-ups that use uh, validity proofs of some form. Um, and the other part is uh, data availability that needs to be scaled, and that we now know how to scale using data availability sampling. 
Okay, so let's talk about what, what this mysterious data availability problem is. So the definition of data availability, it means that no participant in your network, and that includes, and that's the subtle part, a colluding consensus supermajority. So let's say even if in Bitcoin all the miners colluded or in Ethereum all the validators colluded, they should not have the ability to withhold data. And current, like, or traditional blockchains, they do this by simply making all nodes download all the data, right? And uh, because of this, it's not possible to withhold data because if uh, someone doesn't make available a full block, if like Bitcoin miners didn't post their full block but only part of it, then the full nodes would simply not accept this block. They wouldn't even see it. Um, but the question is, how are we going to make this scalable? And scalable means that the work required to verify this should be less than downloading the full blocks. So it should only be a constant or logarithmic amount of work compared uh, to the total amount of data that we want to verify availability of. Um, and so to make this more clear, I think data availability is like, the name is unfortunately not like super clear what it is. It often causes confusion. So what it is, is it is the assurance that data was not withheld um, or you can also say that it was published. What it is not is, uh, it, it has nothing to do with data storage, and it has nothing to do with continuously making this available after the fact. Like, it is really like this initial publishing at the point where the blog was created that um, we want to get uh, assurances about. And why is scaling data really so important? I, was already, I already got into this quickly before. Um, so the two uh, known uh, primitives that can scale universal computation, so things like smart contracts, a thing that we, for example, care about Ethereum, um, are execution sharding or rollups. And um, both of these, like, are dependent on data availability for the security. Like, if you don't have data availability, you can, in some cases, get some properties, but you don't get the full security properties of these scaling properties. Cool, so let's uh, go into data availability sampling. So um, the way it works is um, you erasure code your data. As an example, um, I, I will talk about Reed Solomon codes, which are the most uh, common erasure codes that we use. So what you do is you take your original data and um, the, these are the, the blue uh, boxes you see here, um, D0 to D3. And um, you interpolate a polynomial through these and evaluate it at a number of points, say like the same number again, uh, which would give you a coding rate of 0 0.5, so like 50% um, of the encoding is the original data. And um, it also means that any 50% are um, sufficient to reconstruct the full data. So this is like a property of polynomials. Um, if you have a number of evaluations of a polynomial equivalent to like the degree plus one, then you can always get back the original um, polynomial. And uh, so if you do this, then you can do the following. Um, a client um, will request a random number of evaluations of this polynomial. And um, if the client uh, can get these evaluations, then they know that with a very high probability, um, enough evaluations will be available to reconstruct the data. So like, if you, if you did this on just the original data, it would not work because um, even like a very small amount of data missing is catastrophic. You can never re, uh, recover the whole data. But thanks to erasure coding, we only need to get in this example, for example, 50%, um, which we can assure. Cool, so let's talk about uh, progress in uh, uh, the, the theory here. Um, it's really cool, we have a, a paper by um, Hal Andersen, uh, Simkin and Wagner, which um, has uh, now formulated um, uh, data will be sampling as um, a rigorous cryptographic primitive. And um, uh, the way we see this um, is, uh, I, I go through their definition, so, um, what we start with, we have um, some, uh, some original data, uh, which we uh, put through this um, encoding box. 
And what comes out is a commitment um, and the encoded data, uh, including a proof. So that's this pi. So we have a commitment and um, a proof. And um, then what happens is that um, each client um, will sample this proof. So they request uh, small parts um, of this pi. Um, and um, while they are doing this, they create a transcript. Um, and finally, an important part of data we'll be sampling is this extractor. So the property that we want is that um, uh, if, so data will be sampling does not work if there's only a single client um, that is sampling because you could always send them the samples and uh, uh, never send any other samples again and then clearly those samples would not be enough um, to, to be sure that um, you can reconstruct the data. However, if you have many clients doing this, then data resampling is secure um, because from their combined uh, samples, which here we are calling the transcripts, um, you can regain the original data. And so this is formalized by saying there's an extractor algorithm that if you have a specific uh, number of this transcript, um, can give you back the original data. So like if you have enough transcripts, then you get back the original data. So yeah, this is a very exciting work that we have. We now have a rigorous formalization of this. Um, and so let's go into um, the encoding. Um, so uh, one particular way, um, so there, there, are, there are different ways of getting to an encoding, but one of the problems that you have always is how do you ensure that the encoding is valid? Um, and so something that um, we basically started uh, looking at a few years ago is if you, uh, if you use um, polynomial commitments, in particular KCG commitments, which are extremely efficient, um, then you can gar get a guaranteed uh, encoding simply because uh, KCG commitments always um, commit to a polynomial. So in this case, for example, when, where we have these um, four um, original uh, data points and we extend it to four more points, we can simply say, okay, the fir fir first four points we say as f of zero, f of one, f of two, f of three, and then we evaluate it at four, five, six, and seven, and then like, um, if we just commit to this polynomial defined by the first four points, we have uh, always a guaranteed um, encoding for this. And uh, so in particular, if you only have a vector commitment, like for example, Merkle root, which is a, a type of vector commitment, then you cannot guarantee that the encoding itself is correct. Um, and uh, what, um, what we found is that um, like using a simple 1D uh, a commitment and practice is, is usually not good enough because what you want is that uh, not only you could reconstruct this if you have, um, uh, if you have the full um, amount of data or like at enough samples of the full amount, but you want that this is reconstruct, uh, can be reconstructed locally. So this is um, uh, a few years ago, we came up with, with this uh, 2D uh, scheme where you basically um, commit to a two-dimensional polynomial um, using a number of KCG commitments, uh, for one, one for each row of this. And then what you get is the property that uh, you can comp uh, reconstruct each row and each column individually, um, which is a really nice property because you, you only need a very small amount of the data to reconstruct some of it, and so the reconstruction of data, um, which is this extractor algorithm that we saw previously, uh, can be completely distributed as well. Um, and so um, one of the big questions that we had last year um, was practically uh, can, can we compute, efficiently compute this encoding and all the proofs um, at, uh, at the scales that we are interested in. Um, so for example, for Ethereum, we want to eventually provide uh, 32 megabytes of data per block. Um, and um, over the last uh, year, uh, two different teams have actually um, uh, imp started implementing this um, on a GPU. And uh, we very recently um, got the first results from that. So we're currently like Oswick and Cardozo um, have managed to get this in um, a bit over 20, uh, a bit under 20 seconds on an NVIDIA 3090, so quite a low consumer grade uh, CPU, uh, GPU. Um, and uh, they expect that they will be able to optimize this in the next few months to about five seconds. But actually we have an even better 
um, result now, uh, which with Ingo and Yama, which managed to do this in just five seconds, and they are hoping to get this uh, to one second. So we're now quite confident that, like, uh, computing the um, computing the encoding with proofs is actually practical. So um, let's get into providing the samples. Um, uh, so um, one thing in particular um, I want to get into, like what several teams have looked at into the last year, is okay. What what if we have uh, nodes that simply have all the samples? So the the full node or super node model is you have a number of um, super nodes, which are these blue boxes here, and what a light client, which is the smiley face. They're they're smiley because they are happy that they don't have to download all the data. Um, so what they do is they just ask any of these super nodes for the samples that they want. So that's these random samples. Um, but in addition, they have to do something else. So remember that we want to be able to um, reconstruct this if someone, um, if, if only some, like if someone doesn't give everyone all the samples. And so what they need to do is to send, when they are sampling, so they need to send the samples to um, other super nodes that they are connected to, so that if like uh, some dishonest provider only gives uh, their samples to one of the super nodes or they're controlling some of them, that this cannot um, split the network. And um, so the, the principle is simple. Uh, you have a sampling node that connects to a number of super nodes, let's say 10, and um, it requests um, uh, samples uh, from all the super nodes, re-uploads them to any that are missing them. And the nice property of this is that this is safe as long as a sampling node is connected to at least one honest super node. So it's a nice property like um, because we have this um, very uh, cool um, honest super uh, honest minority guarantee, so we only need to depend on a single honest supernode. And um, this, this is currently live on the um, Celestia testnet, and um, I think also a Veil, um, which is the original Polygon uh, project that has now spun out, um, uses it as a backup to their uh, distributed hash table implementation. Um, and yeah, so here's an illustration on how this works in Celestia, for example. So they have a uh, they have their consensus network, which also consists of super nodes, um, but they don't necessarily directly provide the samples, and they have a bridge into a separate network of, um, uh, uh, of, uh, of these nodes that provide uh, samples to the sampling nodes. Um, so it's cool. We, like, we at least know there's one, uh, one working network construction uh, for data available sampling. Um, so let's get into uh, distributed hash tables. So when DAS was first invented, I think like uh, most um, people assumed that there should be a distributed um, a networking data structure serving this, so uh, the natural thing would be to use a DHT. So um, a DHT like Cademlia um, can provide random access uh, to data such as samples um, without any node storing any significant amount of it. Like, it's very distributed. And um, the cool thing is we, have, we now also have um, early results um, by the Codex team, which have been doing research for the past um, few months um, on uh, sampling by DHT. And um, it actually looks very promising. So they have, uh, here we have some simulations of uh, a DHT at a scale of um, about a bit more than 10,000 nodes, 12,000 nodes. Um, and uh, the delays that we see um, are in an acceptable range. So these are CDFs for, like, uh, for sampling, and um, we see that it's like, like within half a second to a second typically at something like six to ten hops typically for sampling. Um, so this is a cool result. So we now, like basically in principle, they, these data structures are able to serve them. Um, However, one of our big concerns with uh, DHTs is that um, they uh, are not that robust to attacks. In particular, they are very, um, the key space in a DHT is very easy to attack because it is um, basically free to create uh, new nodes or network IDs on a DHT. Um, and uh, the one solution we know for this um, is, um, uh, is like a structure called S-Cademlia, which is like secure Cademlia, um, 
which limits the, the creation of new network IDs uh, via a, a proof of work. So we don't like the proof of work, um, but uh, we have an alternative. We can, for example, use the validator registry, but we could also use other identity systems to limit the creation of new network IDs. Um, and uh, uh, the nice thing is we've also recently uh, seen progress on this. Um, so um, a, a team at the Ethereum Foundation um, has uh, developed um, a way of uh, proving that you are a validator on the Ethereum network um, without revealing um, who you are. So it preserves the anonymity of uh, validators. Um, and uh, actually the cool thing is that this is actually quite, quite doable. So like uh, the prover time um, are um, Times are very reasonable. Uh, verifier time proof size uh, would probably ideally see some improvement, but it's, the, uh, it's an acceptable range that we know that um, this is um, possible to implement. Cool. So um, to get to the summary, uh, we've seen like a really cool um, improvement um, in data available sampling, especially over the last year. So like. Um, the original paper came out in 2018. Um, since then, uh, we have like uh, we uh, we had an idea on how to improve the encoding. That was like early 2020. Um, we came up with a 2D KCG encoding, um, and then like we saw a lot lot of progress within the last year, where like we now have uh, two projects that have. Um, uh, proven on testnet at least that uh, DAS is vi viable, um, and uh, we have seen like great progress on the theory, and um, as well the practice um, of uh, creating uh, DHTs for DAS. Um, I quickly want to also, uh, if there's anyone here who is interested in working on this problem, um, it's still uh, the most interesting part. I think is to work on um, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer data structures. So. Um, in particular, uh, what, what I'm in, still interested in is like how can we make DHTs more resistant to DOS? How can we uh, increase their resistance to key space attacks? And in particular, um, I think if we want to really mainly rely on DHTs for DAS rather than um, uh, the super node model, then uh, we would need to find a way to make them robust to rather large malicious super majorities. So for example, a DHT that would be resistant to a 90% attack would be particularly interesting. Cool. Thank you. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. Maybe I can kick off with a question of my own. Uh, so you showed how to use K. CG commitments to show that a piece of data that's been committed to is correctly formatted, mm -hmm. that a valid polynomial right. has been committed to. Um, but what if the data that's been committed to is garbage, mm -hmm. uh, isn't a valid block? Do you have a way of showing that, in fact, what's been committed to is right. meaningful and not mm -hmm. just correctly formatted? Right, so data availability is only talking, so we literally reduce the problem to saying, here is some piece of data that is available. And you can do with it whatever you want. So you need some other, some other mechanism to ensure the, correct, the correctness of the data in some way. So for example, a rollup does this by claiming, okay, here's some piece of data, and here is a new state route that follows from executing that piece of data. And then they have a mechanism of proving that. So for example, this, the easiest way is if you have like a validity proof of some sort, like a Z, ZK proof in uh, uh, quotation marks, then um, it would simply say, well, it's guaranteed that this input results in this new state root, and then you have no questions. Like, there's some, something in that data that results in this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, nice talk. Uh, my question was regarding DHTs. Mm -hmm. So uh, once you start assuming failures or malicious failures, uh, do you already have some intuition what DHT designs could be better? So can, will, can you make Kademlia itself work against the malicious failures, or do you think uh, that problem may require rethinking of the DHT design itself? And right. do you expect that the performance will take a huge uh, setback mm -hmm. when you start tolerating Byzantine failures? It's a good question. So I mean, I think like as Kademlia shows that you can get some resistance to malicious peers, 
Um, but uh, I think like it doesn't work very well if you need to be resistant to a very high majority um, of malicious peers. So it would be interesting if we can improve the performance on that. Yes, like that you don't have to do an insane number of parallel lookups. Say. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so in the original paper since 2018, I think there was a notion of selective disclosure attacks where a client connects to some nodes and the malicious node responds with only to a specific client. They target a specific client by AP, mm -hmm. let's say. Right. They don't reply to any of the other clients. Right. Mm -hmm. So they try to convince a specific client that the data is available, mm -hmm. but it's actually not. Correct. Do you yeah. treat that somehow in your work? Do you look into that? Um, so the guarantee that DAS gives you is so it, 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 they, they, it is somewhat weakened to like traditional data public guarantees in that um, an attacker can actually trick um, a finite, like a small number of nodes into believing the data is available. There's almost nothing you can do about that. I mean, okay, we can, you can hu heuristically do some things. Like if you give clients anonymity, um, into sampling, you would improve that because then it's very hard to target a specific node. But it's still like, you, what if you can split the network, for example? So I think like very strictly speaking, we're not promising that you can never trick any client because if you can say isolate one node, you can tell the, give them that data and they'll have that data and like nobody else has and it's not enough to reconstruct so it doesn't give you anything. Yeah. So it's, yeah. you, you need a large number of nodes doing the DAS to get the guarantees. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious why you ask the client to upload the missing samples. Mm -hmm. If the nodes could be already malicious, like what's the benefit to the entire system? And the follow-up right. question to this, if the whole, the, the, the initial motivation to save bandwidth with all the new sampling and back and forth communication, do you have more like quantitative analysis Mm -hmm. Are we really getting you no know, redu reduction in the bandwidth, the actual mm -hmm. bandwidth usage? Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first, why do you upload um, mm -hmm. the data? So basically, the guarantee that you get is, let's say, if you have a finite number of, uh, so you have a certain threshold of honest data ever be sampling clients, um, then their information will be enough to reconstruct the whole data. And so if you want to be part of that set, if you want to get that guarantee, you should make sure that the samples that you get will be available publicly, right? So that's why you should upload it to, to, to get that guarantee. And um, the second thing is so, yes, like the, the improvements are huge and you, like, I mean, it's, it's a constant amount of work. So no matter how much uh, data you have, um, like the amount of uh, number of samples is basically constant. So like, I mean, say at the Ethereum scales, like what you're saying, like uh, downloading 100 samples uh, would cost you about like 50 kilobytes in bandwidth versus 32 megabytes of a block. So yeah, the saving is huge. And even if you multiply that with a factor of 10 because you're like querying a DHT and have several hops, then you would still have a, a very big saving. Yeah. But the upload still doesn't guarantee it will be available for later download, right? Because you're essentially... right. Just doing your part, hope, right. hoping the, the super node will behave. Right. You, you're assuming that there's one of them that's honest. Like if there's one honest super node, oh. then it does guarantee that. So yes. that, that's the potential depends on how many are malicious. That's the wasted bandwidth there. Right? Hmm? If, right. if, if there are, say, because you, you say only, you need only one honest, yeah. if all the other are malicious, even though a client yeah. upload, there was, they could still discard the data. Right? So for, from the client perspective, right. they, they didn't the really malicious one could. The malicious can do anything. Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Don Crowd again for an excellent talk. <laughs> this concludes this session. The next session is our lightning talk session.